Laura Viers. Welcome to E-Town. Thanks for being here. I think I first, um, I don't know if I saw you before then, but I certainly remember seeing you with the Case Lang Viers uh, show when that came through Denver with uh, Nico Case and, and Katie Lang. Mm -hmm. And that project, I think, weren't you the principal songwriter for that, that record? I, was, I ended up being that, yeah. I was the, the smallest um, draw for the live show. But uh, maybe the more of the muscle behind the song. Oh, the little power that could behind the scenes. Yeah, that was a great combo. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I felt happy to be a part of it. It was Katie Lang's idea, and um, she just emailed us out of the blue one day, and I was like, let me check my schedule. I'm free. Because <laughs> I had been a fan of hers as a teenager. Of course, you know, yeah. You all had. Staring at her record cover like, ooh, she's so cool, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, that was that was nice to see you and back, you know, being back in your home state. I'd forgotten that you're from Colorado. From where? From where? Colorado you grow? Springs. Colorado Springs. Yeah, my dad taught at Colorado College, and my mom was a school teacher. Yeah. And what did your dad teach? Physics. Physics. So you grew up uh, being a practically minded young woman, I suspect. Well, and a lot of nature trips, yeah. as most people here take. It's yeah. a beautiful place to go exploring, and a lot of my songs have been influenced by that, by the trips that we took, because they were both teachers, so we would take lots of um, summer vacation trips into the high into the mountains, climbing the 14ers, eating the wild strawberries, tickling the trout, all of that stuff, watching the aspen leaves, and all of that stuff, like building snow caves, snow camping. They were really vigorous outdoors people, yeah. and that really influenced my writing. Yeah. And none of that happens anymore because every all the kids just have iPhones. Right. You yeah. don't need to build a snow yeah. cave anymore. Just, they, 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 none of that's going on. Really. <laughs> snow caves don't happen. No. <laughs> Please tell me they still do. I hope they do, but um, but uh, I wouldn't know. You, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> you don't hang out with the snow cave I'm not, making I don't, kids. I don't, I'm not taking any kids camping these days. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, so, the interestingly, the, the title of your new record, The Lookout... Um, is in some ways it, it, it's not different in in some ways from what you just described with your your parents taking you up into the mountains and sort of keeping an eye on things and and protecting you guys. There mm -hmm. is that theme running through that song at least. I imagine that was written maybe with your husband in mind. Mm -hmm. or, that song in particular, yeah, yeah. The album's called The Lookout, and then there's the title track, which ended up being a, about my husband Tucker, who's been my producer for 18 years. And we've made 10 records. And he he does symbolize that for me, the person who's looking out for um, me and my our kids and and you know other other people throughout the songs are looking out for other things. And um, I was exploring the idea of us keeping an eye out for each other, protecting each other, having community, having um, positivity in the world when mm -hmm. there is so much that is full of strife and confusion and and I feel that confusion too and, and there's songs like the song I wrote called The Meadow about the transience of beautiful things that you know things are beautiful in the moment but then they're quickly gone and I feel like there's just not a lot that we can hold on to right now that feels right. stable and feels um solid and so I talked about that and yeah. explore that in the writing of my new record. But you also have to raise kids, and you have to keep up that you keep that sort of practical thing going of of uh, food and shelter and school and activities and and positivity and optimism and planning an idea that planting the seeds for your kids that they can grow into a life that's going to welcome them in some way. Yes, and I think that's one of the great things about having kids is that feeling that the next generation is going to turn things over and um, turn over a new leaf and. And we can see that hopefully in the next election, we'll get some more blue into the offices yeah. and see if we can turn this around yeah. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do feel heartened by young people. My I do too, except only 20% of millennials vote. That part really bothers that, that me. Bothers and I, me see, too. I see so many registration calls on yeah. Instagram, which is Instagram's the young person's platform. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that some of the, my friends who have more like rock star status are encouraging young people to vote because yeah. it's, uh, it's weird to me that they don't vote. Yeah, it's odd. But anyway, well, that's another subject. They um, don't build snow caves and they don't vote. <laughs> it's all the stupid cell phone. I I'm hate telling young you. people. <laughs> Oh. All right. Well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, you are um, you're, you're, you're a mom, as we talked about it. So you've got some kids who are still pretty young. Um, you've done a couple of projects that were kid focused, or at least one anyway. You did a record. Was it with 
Jim James and Bela Fleck and some other people mm -hmm. you made a, like a kid's record? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, my husband and I had just had our second, our first kid and we were like, oh my God, this is so exhausting. I didn't want to write songs. So we culled through a lot of old American and British uh, Isles folk songs and, and made an album of covers. And that was fun just to connect with some of the songs that my parents sang to me, like The Fox and um, Jamaica Farewell growing up. And also new ones like Prairie Lullaby and um, King Kong Kijikichi Kaimyo and other ones like Little Lat Dog Lullaby that I discovered um, by researching this woman named Ruth Crawford Seeger, who was um, oh, yeah. the wife of Charles Seeger, who was an, she was a really cool avant-garde composer in the 50s and also a music collector and archivist. And she was a piano teacher and collector of songs. And she made a really cool album called Animal Folk Songs for Children that Peggy Seeger right. did. And so those actually yeah. were some of the songs that we did. And it was just fun to go into that world and, right. and discover some of those old songs that seem to pass on through generations. Well, that, con that connects to another story, another project of yours, which is the story of Elizabeth Cotton. Elizabeth Cotton is... Um, uh, project, uh, it was ended up being a book. Yeah. You yeah, I wrote a children's book about yeah. her and it came out in January. And um, yeah, Elizabeth Cotton was discovered by the Seeger family. She happened to be their uh, help on Saturdays. And one day she, she started playing their guitars because they had the guitars all over the house and they were like, wait, what? <laughs> she's yeah. a genius. <laughs> and and right. she was this elderly woman who played beautiful finger style guitar and wrote amazing songs having her musical flowering in her 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, in case any of you feel like you've already yeah. done your greatest work. Yeah, there's time. Libba it's not too got late. got a Grammy when she was 90. Yeah. <laughs> so there's hope for us I all. Did a, I did a workshop with her in the late 70s at the uh, Vancouver Folk Festival. That's awesome. She was just elegant and great and a really good guitar player, upside down, backwards. And uh, she wrote Freight Train, among other songs. Um, so what kind of stories do you think... Um, younger generations will glean from learning about people like Libba Cotton? I would hope they would think I can learn an instrument any way I want to learn it. And she picked up the guitar backwards, upside down, because she didn't know any better and became like a virtuosic fingerstyle player. And um, so that idea of you can do something your own way is important with her story. And also you can have a flowering late in life. You don't have to um, push your dreams down. They can come out at any time. And and she expressed that through her perseverance and her yeah. touring as a musician around the world in her very late in life in her 80s and 90s. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And it's kind of it's one of those nice ironies about the Seekers being uh, so uh, such champions of folk music and traditional music and um, and and uh, egalitarian ways and progressive views and civil rights and so on. But then I wonder if they were embarrassed by the fact that Libba Cotton was their maid. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like, whoa, that's a little awkward. <laughs> yeah, but I think also back in those days, that was the 50s, 60s, yeah. it was more common to have African-American help yeah. or just any help at all in your right. house coming in to work and iron, yeah. iron things on Saturdays. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your new record and then we got to get back to songs. But um, I like the one, The Best Kept Secret. Uh, I, I'm sure there are... Everyone who lives in Los Angeles in that neighborhood in Silver Lake is, is, is hoping that you've written that song about them. <laughs> yeah. That song's about a friend of mine named Tim Young. Oh, you're going to tell? Yeah. Yeah. He knows. Everybody, oh. I mean, who I know knows. But he's an old friend who I've always called when in times of struggle. And, um, and he gives me advice about things. Yeah. He's a wonderful musician and a great singer and guitar player and doesn't, you know, not famous. Plays with great people. Yeah. Sideman, you know. Right. Uh, but unsung hero. But it's funny. I thought it would be sort of live on like that sort of uh, Carly Simon's You're So Vain, You Probably Think This Song Is About mm -hmm. You kind of thing where everyone would say, well, who do you think it's written about? Because <laughs> the person is so nice in the yeah. song. They're yeah, such yeah. a hero. They're, yeah. they're a good friend. They're a good player. They can sing. They can do everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's, uh, you know, there's some, some acknowledgement of the discomfort. Um, there's your song about uh, When It Grows Darkest. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a tough perspective to latch on to. Um, maybe you can just you know the idea is that when it grows darkest, that's when the stars come out. And so when you're in these times of trouble and tricky and and you're feeling exasperated and frustrated and overwhelmed and um, in some cases hopeless, um, to remember that when it's darkest, that's when the stars come out. I mean, it's very literal, right? Yeah. Everybody's been on those tall mountaintops, not maybe everybody, but probably everybody in this room has been on a tall mountaintop <laughs> late at night, far from a city, and seeing that yeah. gorgeous display of the starlight. 
that, that comes when it's truly dark outside. So we know that it's literally true, but also you can see that in yourself when things get tricky, you, sh you see your internal fire come out and you shine and you get, you rise above the ad adversity that's pushing you down. And that's yeah. what we need to do right now. And we are doing it, but I feel like we really need to keep, keep doing it. Well, bef you know, let me just ask you about, cause, cause that's an option. It's a choice. Some people in that, in that circumstance, in fact, just go down the rabbit hole of the 24 hour news feed and checking their news and looking at websites and, and getting deeper and deeper into the latest, uh, the latest, um, you know, challenge, whatever it is. Into the darkness. Into the darkness, yeah. So, I, and I think that that's an option that's much easier now because all that stuff is so available all the time. So it's harder in some ways to say, okay, hold on. I'm going to walk outside. I'm going to look at the stars. I'm going to try to take a deep breath, get some inner strength, think about where the positivity lies. Yeah, I mean, I think, especially as a mother, I can't dwell in hopelessness. Sometimes I feel tempted to do that because I feel like, oh, that's maybe more realistic. But um, that's just not my... Yeah. my Calling. Yeah, My calling is to be bringing light and brightness to the world if I can. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think about being a kid in the, in the 50s and, um, you know, the, the uh, nuclear uh, bomb shelters and the things we went, we went under our desks in case of a nuclear bomb. That was mm -hmm. very practical training. <laughs> <laughs> that desk is really going to help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it did infuse a certain amount of anxiety into the For into sure. society. Well, you know, I mean, like, honestly, my my kindergartner has to have lockdowns now and lockdown drills in kindergarten because a bad guy's going to come maybe into the school. Oh, so no. I mean, that's reality. Yeah, that's much closer to reality. It in is. fact, yeah, it is. Sadly, it is. Yeah. Well, listen, I like all this stuff. And I like, as I was saying, you know, again, I'm going to cling for a little while to this concept, this loose concept that this is, you know, finding things that are broken and trying to fix them. That's sort of what, the, what this is about. So I appreciate, I see that in your songwriting and I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get back to music. Welcome back, if you would, Laura Veers. Hi, this is Nick Forster from E-Town. If you want to stay up to date with all the performances, interviews, and behind-the-scenes footage, click the subscribe button. Thanks.